This is Molly Hemingway, encouraging you to listen to my favorite podcast, Issues, etc. Every day you get in-depth interviews with host Todd Wilkin asking expert guests substantive, thought-provoking questions on all of the important news and issues of our day. The expert guests are in culture, law, ethics, philosophy, theology, and apologetics. Expert guests, expansive topics, always extolling Christ, issues, etc. It's kind of hard to believe what passes for educational policy that goes beyond, in many of our public schools, simply trying to educate children, now trying to allegedly protect children from their parents, transgender children from their parents, well, even knowledge that the child may be transitioning. Welcome back to Issues Etc. I'm Todd Wilkin. Joining us to talk about a California law forbidding schools from informing parents of their child's gender transition, Nirja Despande. She's Educator and Freedom Center Engagement Coordinator at the Independent Women's Forum and author of a column for The Federalist titled Parents Sue Gavin Newsom for Forcing Schools to Hide Children's Transgender Identities. Nirja, welcome. Thank you so much for having me on. What is California Assembly Bill 1955? Yeah, so California Governor Gavin Newsom signed this bill into law in July. So this bill is actively against parental rights. So that's sort of the upshot of it. It prohibits school districts from implementing any parental notification policy that would require district teachers and staff to notify a child's parents if that child decides to go by a different name or a different pronouns in school. So let's say you have a son named John. John starts identifying as Jane and tells his teachers, I'm Jane now and I'm using she, her pronouns. Your school district cannot mandate that that teacher inform you that John is now going by Jane. So that's the basic policy. It stops the teachers and stops the staff from having to inform parents about these major decisions that their children are making. What has been Judge Michael Sachs' role in this ongoing issue? Yeah, so in 2023, Michael Sachs sort of had already ruled on this, and he said, oh, and then placed pause on this rule, and he said, um, oh, this policy targets the trans community, and so he called the discriminatory on its face, that's the exact quote, and then he said the district did not consider any gender-neutral alternatives, so he was sort of acting as though this was a sort of policy that specifically targets transgender students or transgender-identifying students, rather, as opposed to understanding that this is just a policy that's specifically about one issue and within the context of a bigger issue of parental rights, right? Parents have the right to know what's happening with their children. That this is specifically about gender ideology doesn't make it discriminatory somehow. Um, And then in 2024, the same judge, you know, he said, and this was quoted favorably by um, many sort of liberal media outlets, he said, oh, my job is to have the back of students who have unsupportive parents. He literally said that my job as a judge is to have their backs rather than saying, okay, my job as a judge is to, you know, make constitutionally legally sound rulings. He did not say that. He said, my job as a judge is to have their backs, the backs of students who are identifying as transgender without any sort of consideration as to like their parents or as to what's actually in their best interest. Why are parental notification requirements in the best interests of children? Yeah, so, I mean, even if you accept child sex transition as an unmitigated good, right? So let's say you're a parent who is completely happy if your child starts to identify as a member of the opposite gender. It's still in children's best interest for their parents to know what's going on in their lives. So even in those cases, children aren't allowed to go on field trips without parental notification permission. Children are supposed to have their report cards signed by their parents. There are all sorts of places where children are controlled. And this is children of parents who affirm transgender identity. This is children of parents who do not affirm transgender identity. So with most things, we can acknowledge that parents knowing their child's whereabouts or their activities are necessary. We know that those, even with field trips, with report cards, with all these like little, little things in school, like parents are supposed to know what's going on with their kids. And that's not a political thing, right? That's just, that's just a basic common sense fact. So why should gender identity be any different? So I'm old enough to remember when we warned children to report adults who tried to get them to keep sexual secrets from their parents. We literally all grew up with that. And then with this 
policy in California does is it's enshrining that sort of secrecy into law. It's just really bad news for children, right? You asked me why these notification requirements are in the best interest of children. This is just sexual exploitation and abuse, quite frankly, in the name of progress, in the name of protecting children. It's really vile. Some have called parental notification requirements in schools discriminatory. How do you respond? Yeah, activists often say that this is like about abusive families, but they're just assuming that parents are guilty until proven innocent. And it's not even clear what those parents are necessarily guilty of. But often what will happen is that like activists just say, oh, parents shouldn't, you know, have any right to know anything. Like, what are those parents guilty of? If you have parents who know what they're talking about, if they're, they're good, decent, sound parents who are acting in the best interest of their child, who aren't abusing their child, which you have to presume is the majority of parents, right? That is the majority of parents. And, you know, if there's some serious situation going on, then that's for child protection services. That's not the same thing as a requirement that forces teachers to just ensure that the majority of good, sane, decent parents has to be informed about what their child is doing in school. You know, there's just nothing discriminatory about that. It's not it's not about discrimination. It's about a parent knowing their child's whereabouts and activities, right? That's, that's literally what it comes down to. It is the same thing as a parent knowing if a child is on a field trip. It is the same thing as a parent knowing if a child is failing math, right? I've been a teacher before myself. I've had to make calls saying like, hey, your child is failing math for X, Y, Z reasons. Here is how your child can succeed in math. Is that discrimination against students who are failing math as opposed to students who aren't failing math? I don't think so. I, I think that's just I think that's just a fact of life that if something is changing, if something's gone wrong, those parents have to be notified. Gender activists insist that using preferred pronouns is merely social transitioning, not medical, so it shouldn't require parental notification. Is that true? Yeah, so I mean, I think it's basic psych- human psychology that that's not true, right? Because it's not just about your body. It's also about, you know, your mind and, and what you're sort of setting yourself on track to do. So social transition often sets transgender identified people, and this is regardless of age, on track to taking cross-sex hormones and undergoing transgender surgery. So when the state makes it illegal for districts to mandate that parents know what's going on with their kids, California is effectively allowing schools to make medical decisions for children. And this is sort of, this has been proven in various sort of medical um, literature, right? Kids who are on social transition track, on the track of changing their pronouns, changing their, changing their dress, changing, changing their names. Those children often do end up taking surgeries and they often do end up taking hormones and different drugs that are supposed to make them resemble the opposite sex somehow. And Medical research also shows that the overwhelming majority of children who experience confusion about their sex eventually grow out of it. And then what happens with early social transition is that these children are sort of cemented into a gender identity that in the absence of affirmation, if the school had said, actually, no, we're not calling John Jane. We're not letting you do this without some amount of parental notification or permission or whatever. It would just be a phase. We're not allowing those kids to have those phases. And like, as I was sort of saying, it's human psychology. If I'm 14 years old and I say, okay, I'm going to change my name from Jane to John. Even if I'm 17, okay, I've spent the past three years of my life living as John. I'm going to want to just at, at that point actually feel the medical transition. And that's something that schools just like refuse to admit that a lot of the social transition stuff is literally on track for medical transition. And again, if you look at the requirements often of medical transition, they do, you know, plastic surgeons and um, these sort of gender doctors, they often say, oh, have you been socially transitioned yet? Right. That is a question that they often ask people who are trying to get these surgeries and medical procedures and whatever. So again, like it really is a preliminary step. So like schools are taking this preliminary step when they transition children without their parents' um, notification. And like beyond that, a lot of these children who identify as transgender, 70% of them have mental health issues. So that is a really, really high incidence of mental health issues. And again, it's, it's a medical step when the school is interfering on behalf of the parents to sort of take especially this population of kids and just 
subject them to this sort of completely new psychological paradigm and allow them to just sort of be part of this completely new psychological paradigm and sort of not acknowledge the the medical repercussions of that psychological change and of that social change. What should be done with children who are confused about their gender? I think the truth is, like, I can't say. I, I, I don't I don't fully know the answers. I feel like, you know, at Independent Women's Forum, like, we have done a lot of work on detransitioners, for instance, people who started identifying as members of the opposite sex or gender and took those hormones, took those treatments, and then eventually said, actually, no, I am my biological sex. So we, we've talked to, to many of those people. We've profiled them. We have them as ambassadors. And I just think you look at their stories and you look at just how much brainwashing there was, how many lives there were, how much of this was just activists sort of sitting there and preying on these really young, vulnerable people, you know, at these really vulnerable and pivotal moments in their lives. Children, right? <laughs> there are people, but they're children fundamentally at these points. And really, you know, I think what it comes down to is just having open conversations with your children. I think having some space where children can push back even, right? Say, oh, no, I believe this. Well, here's why we believe this. And like having having rational sort of debates, I think, I think helps in a way that completely cl- closing off the conversation doesn't think, oh, no, we don't do this. Right. I think that's I think it's it's good, especially at a young age to tell children, oh, yeah, like we don't believe that you can go from one gender to another. It's good for people to, you know, raise their children with those basic values, in my opinion. But but a lot of this also just comes down to, OK, like, you know, you just have to have the conversation open. I don't think it's I, I think children ultimately are going to become adults and they're going to make their own decisions. So you just want them to be making decisions that are ideally well-informed and thought out and, you know, that they can just sort of come home and say, okay, like, this is what I learned in school. What do you think? And and have that back and forth without being scared that they're going to somehow be pushed back on at home or that they're going to get yelled at. I think that openness, I think that frankness in this day and age really matters. Um, but I also think, I mean, from sort of a policy perspective, if you look at movements like school choice, right, where the idea is that instead of you having to go to your public school, you having to go to the school that the government has assigned to you, basically, um, that your, your your tax dollars can actually send your child to a maybe a religious school, right? Maybe a school that's just like a sane or a charter school and just having or just private school vouchers. So basically, point being like, there are also policy proposals to make people less dependent on public schools because their tax dollars are funding those public schools, but then those public schools are pushing these ideologies. So I think that's also sort of like an intermediary step where some of it might mean in some cases, like pulling children out of these environments, right? Pulling children out of places where they're just being indoctrinated and propagandized. But again, like it depends on families' financial situations and social situations and all these factors. I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all solution to this, but I do think that there's some level of, you know, if you if you keep things open with your child, if, if your child knows that they're going to be cared for at home, and if you also like make it clear, like, okay, like you're not, you know, you are my child, you're going to be in places that, you know, are aligned with my values. I think that also is really valuable and important. Some California parents are taking legal action. Tell us about that. Yeah, so America First Legal, which is a legal organization, has filed a lawsuit against Gavin Newsom. And so basically what America First Legal is saying, and I'll just actually quote them. I have this pulled up here. They say, quote, on their website, This law violates the 14th Amendment, which guarantees the rights of parents to make decisions about their minor children regarding all medical treatment. In this case, social, quote unquote, transitioning. Fit parents are presumed to act in the best interest of their child. The government cannot intervene in their relationship simply because it does not like the parent's decision. Whether a child socially transitions or announces their sexuality is a personal and private issue, not an educational issue or one to be decided by the government. The state of California is thus intruding in a very personal and private matter, communication on one of the most intimate topics between a parent and a child in violation of the U.S. Constitution. That's basically the the legal argument that they're making, and it's one, obviously, that I find quite compelling. Make the case for parental notification requirements in our school. 
Yeah, I mean, again, like this isn't this isn't even about affirming or not affirming children's gender identities. It's not about whether or not you accept gender ideology. This is about a very basic sense that parents have the right to know their children's whereabouts. They have the right to know their children's activities. They have the right to know what's going on with their children in school. And if you take that away from parents, be those parents liberal or conservative, be those parents religious or irreligious, be those parents, you know, um, pro-gender ideology or anti-gender ideology or somewhere in between, that doesn't matter. What matters is that those are parents who are acting in the best interest of their children. Those parents have a right to know. This is not about anything besides besides the parents' rights to know. And I think it's it's deeply dishonest that activists are trying to frame this as discrimination as opposed to a basic right for parents and also the best interest of children. Nirja Despondi is Education Freedom Center Engagement Coordinator at Independent Women's Forum, author of a column for The Federalist titled Parents Sue Gavin Newsom for Forcing Schools to Hide Children's Transgender Identities. You can read it at issueztc.org. Click Talk On Demand Archives. Nirja, thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day. Well, over the weekend, the Lutheran Church of Australia approved female pastors. This is the end, a sad end, to a very long argument in that church body. Pastor Matt Harrison, president of the Lutheran Church of Missouri Center, will join us next to talk about it. The church's music from the second century. Shepherd of tender youth, guiding in love and truth. The sixth century. The twelfth century. The 16th century. The 21st century. The best of the church's music from the past 2,000 years. LutheranPublicRadio.org your comprehensive source for information, teaching, and truth. You're listening to Issues Etc. This is Pastor Matthew Harrison, President of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. The LCMS operates the second largest parochial school system in the United States. What can you expect from a Lutheran Church Missouri Synod school? There's one race, the human race. And Jesus died for the sins of every man, woman, and child from every land and every nation. Life begins at conception. All life is precious from womb to tomb. And every student, parent, and teacher is created in the very image of God. There's right and wrong, and we know which is which from the Ten Commandments. There are only two sexes, male and female, he created them. Marriage is the lifelong union of one man and one woman, There's such a thing as objective, absolute truth, and it's found in the person and work of Jesus Christ and His Word. To find a Lutheran Church Missouri Synod school near you, visit lcms.org slash schools. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Dr. Russell Dawn, president of Concordia University, Chicago. Indeed, the quest for truth is at the core of a university's purpose. The liberal arts, illuminated by the revealed truths of Scripture, are powerful for equipping students for a life of self-governance. A disciple is one who follows the Master. So what does it mean to follow Jesus? He said that it means to take up one's cross. The cross is thus the symbol of dying for others of dying to self for the sake of serving others. And a life of service is a life well lived. Truth, Freedom, Vocation, Concordia University, Chicago, cuchicago.edu. 